This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Nicole Cruson, and I'm pleased to be one of the pastors at Church Street. In just a few minutes, we are going to read from Psalm 119, but first, let's listen as the parish adult choir sings, Do Not Be Afraid. Now a reading from Psalm 119, 
verses 129 through 144. Your decrees are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. With open mouth I, mouth I pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me as is your custom toward those who love your name. Keep my steps steady according to your promise and never let iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from human oppression that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because your law is not kept. You are righteous, O Lord, and your judgments are right. You have appointed your decrees in righteousness and all faithfulness. My zeal consumes me because my foes forget your words. Your promise is well tried and your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is the truth. Trouble and anguish have come upon me, but your commandments are my delight. Your decrees are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. And now reading from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 27 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of humans and the seed of animals. And just as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring evil, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days, they shall no longer say the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, but all shall die for their own sins. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another to say, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And our gospel reading for today comes from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them, and yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? May God bless the reading of the word, and I invite you to pray with me and to pray for me at this time. Loving God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. And I pray that you would take me now and hide me behind the cross, that I would preach for your glory and never for my own. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, so often lately, it seems a common refrain is our thoughts and prayers are with whatever the latest tragedy that has befallen. Most recently, our thoughts and prayers have been with Haiti, the Bahamas, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and all the victims of Hurricane Matthew. Earlier in the year, it was Orlando, Dallas, Charlotte, Tulsa, Baton Rouge, Globally, we pray for Syria, the Middle East in general, Sudan, Paris, Istanbul, and beyond. 
More locally, we've prayed for Bristol, for Athens. We've prayed for Zabion Dobson, and Jaywan Latham. The list can go on and on. I've seen a backlash to all the thoughts and prayers. I've seen some folks say, we don't need your prayers. We need you to act. These sorts of comments give me pause. Do our prayers matter? Are all those thoughts and prayers sincere? Do we really mean it? Is it just a cop out to say our thoughts and prayers are with someone, some group, or something, and then just move on with our lives? What Jesus is getting at when he tells his disciples to pray always and not lose heart. In Luke's gospel, Jesus teaches by showing us how he orders things. Jesus tells us how the world should be according to him. And more often than not, Jesus' way of life is at odds with how things work in the world. To illustrate the value of prayer, Jesus tells the story of the judge who didn't really care. The judge just wanted to be left alone. The judge didn't really put any thought into God and didn't really care about people either. This widow badgered him to death and he finally granted her what was rightfully hers to get her to shut up and just leave him alone. When Jesus told the story about the widow, widows had no real power or status. This is not something to gloss over with Jesus' story. He's getting at something. The very setup of the story Jesus is telling would have sparked interest in his hearers. It was loaded with irony. Unmarried women were not allowed to leave the home of their father. Married women were not allowed to leave the home of their husband. They were normally restricted to roles of little or no authority. They could not testify in court. They could not appear in public venues. They were not allowed to talk to strangers. A woman not tethered to a man in some way had no right to speak to a man, let alone to a judge. Yet the widow speaks up for what is rightfully hers. She likely didn't speak in court. She probably had to badger the judge elsewhere. She wasn't content to just go on with things as they were, to be content with thinking, well, that's just the way it is. That didn't fly with this widow. She knew she was due her rightful judgment and simply demanded what was rightfully due her. The cries of the persistent widow eventually sway the cold heart of the judge who gives in to her request. Jesus reminds us that God is not like the judge. God does care. God does want to hear from us. God does want justice for God's children. Yet there is more. Jesus ends the parable by asking, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Why should the Son of Man not find faith on earth? Perhaps there is doubt in Jesus' question because it's very difficult to keep praying. It's hard to continually keep the faith. This is especially hard when life gets difficult. It's hard when it's our loved one who is ill, when it's our job on the line, when the tragedy isn't abstract but our own. It's hard to keep praying and not lose heart when the headlines and the tragedies keep coming. So how do we not lose heart? How do we keep trusting in God when it seems like nothing will change? This is where the widow become, becomes our teacher. The widow had no rights. She had no reason to expect her situation to change. Yet she didn't lose heart. She kept right on going to the judge, trusting that despite all evidence to the contrary, there would be a breakthrough in her hopelessness. Jesus knew it would be hard for his followers to keep heart, both then, and I expect he knew it would be hard in times to come. Jesus knew that those who followed him would long to see his presence in the world. Jesus knew we would wonder, where in the world is God? That's why we're told not to lose heart. Losing heart is something so many of us can struggle with. I had the opportunity to go to a continuing education event recently and hear Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber share about her own faith and experience. If you haven't heard of her, she's a Lutheran pastor serving a church in the Denver area. She's somewhat irreverent in her speech and demeanor, but when it comes to her faith, she's very serious. 
She's able to connect with all sorts of folks due to her authenticity, her humor, and her honesty. During our time together, an older woman asked Nadia about prayer. The woman volunteered that she struggles with prayer. She says, I pray and I get bored and I think God does too. Yet I catch myself doing it anyway. Nadia's reply to the woman's honesty was, I love you. The older woman at the gathering was an inspiration. In spite of everything, she catches herself praying anyway. We have to keep at it, even when we might get bored, even when we wonder what the point is. So then what is the point of prayer? Does it matter when we hold someone, some place, or some event in our prayers? According to Jesus, it does matter. For when we pray, we are bound to God. We open ourselves to God. We share whatever might cause us pain. Praying also can cause us to name our blessings, but there is also more to prayer. When we pray, we are bound to one another through God. Why do you think Jesus preached about praying those for those who are our enemies, to bless the very ones who persecute us and make life that much more to endure? Because lifting up the very ones we're tempted to hate, to lift up the ones who cause us to question what's the point, makes us bound to one another through God. It's really hard to hate someone you truly pray for. Try it. Really pray for whichever politician you can't stand. Really pray for the family member who has hurt you. Really pray for the boss who has made work unbearable. To do so changes us. It not only binds us to one another through God, prayer helps us see one another through God's eyes and God's heart. Really pray for those whose lives have been torn apart by the recent hurricane. Will you not be moved to act? Really pray for those whose lives are torn apart by violence. Will you not be moved to do something, to search for a better way? When we cease to pray, our hearts shrivel and turn inward. Our minds can take over and we can start to hear all the voices trying to fill us with all the things that aren't true. It's then that we lose heart. When we lose heart, we lose faith. And that's when we can get lost to despair and all the awful things in and around us that try to pull us away from God's love and care for us. This parable is a bit different in that this time God is not like the judge in the parable. God isn't anything like this judge who just wants the widow to go away. God does care, God does want to hear from us. God does want justice for God's children. One thing Nadia Boltz Weber brought up during our time together is that through prayer we can connect to God's persistence God doesn't need to be worn down. God has already acted to bring life from death. God already has spoken that the thing we fear most does not win. God has already answered our deepest longing through Easter. So maybe, just maybe, we need to be worn down. We know through the life and example of Jesus what God wants for God's children. We know that God brings life from death. Jesus taught us what to pray for, God's kingdom, God's will to be done here as in heaven, daily bread, forgiveness, to be led away from temptation and evil. And we know that prayer, through that prayer, that God's kingdom, power, and glory are forever. In a sermon given a few years ago called Prayer and the Persistent Widow, Nadia shared that maybe it is us who, even though we fail to fear God or care about people, are finally worn down by the persistence of a God who longs for justice. Maybe prayer isn't the way in which we manipulate God, but is simply the posture in which we finally become worn down by God's persistence. God's persistence in loving us, God's persistence in forgiving and being made known, and God's persistence in being faithful and always, always, always bringing life out of death. When we pray, we are connected to the God who brings life out of death. 
When we pray, we are connected to the God who loves and forgives and reconciles. When we pray, we are connected to one another through this God who brings life from death. When we pray, we are not alone. Praying and persisting are not how we're taught to be in the Western world. We're taught to be individuals, to be strong, to seek a quick fix. It's easy to want to turn Jesus' parable into a license to pester God with our wish list and to think of God as a genie or a Santa figure. We tend to like things to be fixed. Jesus' message about not losing heart and praying is more than sending God our to-do list. Prayer is anything but a quick fix. Prayer is engaging in a relationship with God and others. Prayer is about connecting with God and one another. We're instructed in Luke and throughout scripture and by the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, to pray without ceasing so we do not lose heart. It's pretty hard to pray without ceasing by ourselves. We need each other. After all, we have to sleep at some point. And there are also times we need others to hold us up in prayer. I've seen that connection work. I've heard time after time how much being prayed for has meant to someone going through a difficult time. I know a young man who survived a terrible accident who said the prayers have saved his life. He didn't feel very connected to God before people started praying for him. And now that connection is strong. And he knows he is loved not only by God, but by others as well. The persistence worked. God loved him all along, but the prayers of others helped him become aware of God's persistent love and care for him. My husband and I experienced persistence in prayer recently when we had to say goodbye to one of our dogs, a beloved family member. In the midst of our sorrow, we felt connected to God through prayer and through the support of those who love us. When we did not have words, we knew the words and love of others were holding us up. We knew we were not alone, and that connection and support helped us not lose heart. As Jesus taught the disciples to pray, we're shown that prayer isn't so much about asking God for what we want, but turning to God and opening to what God wants. God's love is already revealed. Healing and forgiveness are already given. Prayer helps us live into that. Through prayer, God does in fact work. We keep heart by keeping on praying. We keep faith by being open to connection to God and to one another. Prayer is not easy work. It's much easier to write people off, to just lament that the world is broken and beyond help. It's easier to give up. It's easier to be like that judge and just not want to be bothered with it all. But Jesus tells us that's not how it is. God is not like that judge and we shouldn't be either. God already showed what love he has for his world and his children through Easter. The truth is the world is better than what is reported. There is more good than evil. The way we live into that truth is to pray without ceasing, to not lose heart. The more we are connected to God and to one another, the better off the world is for it. The more we pray, the more God's kingdom will come on earth. I actually believe that. Our truth isn't what darkness tries to tell us. Our truth isn't what a politician or analyst tries to scare us into thinking. Our truth is Jesus is Lord. Our truth is life comes from death. Our light shines in darkness, and darkness does not overcome. Our job is to pray and not lose heart. God did not lose heart. God loves, God's love persists. So when we pray, we open our hearts to God's heart, to God's persistent love. When we pray, we open ourselves to God and one another. When we pray, we find our hearts in the heart of God. So yes, prayer matters. May we not lose heart. May the Son of Man find faith when he finds us, and for his faith and his heart have never turned away. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
It has been my joy to be with you in your home this morning. I'm Nicole Crewson, pastor at Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. Thank you for letting me share this devotional time with you. As always, you're invited to join us for worship at 8.30 and 11 o'clock on Sundays and at noon on Wednesdays. May God bless you. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. <laughs>